The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. As always, I am lucky enough to introduce our panelists tonight. First up, we have a returning panelist. He's an NRA instructor, California CCW advocate, and host of Shooter, the series on YouTube. Ed Thorell, welcome back. Hey, it's great to be back. Thanks. Glad to have you. Uh, next up, we've got a newbie. She's an NRA instructor, firearms enthusiast, beyond the unknown on Instagram, and contributor to the Gun Collective. Genevieve Jones, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. All right. Well, you won't be as soon as we get into it because we oh, have great. stories to talk about tonight. Uh, I'm going to kick us right off. First up, several New Mexico counties declared themselves 2A sanctuary cities. And what they mean by that is basically that uh, if the state in, uh, uh, enacts sweeping gun control, uh, they say that th those things don't count in their counties. And this is uh, San Juan, Lincoln, and Eddy counties. They've all adopted these resolutions. And um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm going to start off just getting you guys' thoughts on this. Genevieve, since you're new, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Great. So I think it's really awesome. It's, uh, it's really nice to have more people on our side and hear about that stuff because a lot of times we only hear about the negative laws that are being enacted towards us. So it's great to see people supporting the Second Amendment. Ed? Well, I think it's a great counterpoint to cities and states that are declaring, um, you know, uh, sanctuary cities for illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Either national laws or we're not. We can't pick and choose. I do agree. Now, in Illinois, there's other counties and places that have said, hey, we're, they've pa um, passed resolutions, whatever, locally that say, hey, we're sanctuary cities as well, or counties. Illinois is seeking to block that. Apparently, they don't care about the rule of law, but an Illinois gun maker, I'm sorry, lawmaker, wants to make sure that local governments don't try to flout state gun laws symbolically or otherwise. Uh, the measure comes after dozens of Illinois counties last year passed largely symbolic gun sanctuary ordinances that promised not to enforce unconstitutional gun bans. Uh, this is a freshman state representative in Illinois, and he's kind of running this. But at the very end, it says uh, that Pearson says Costa Howard's bill is a, a home rule issue and that there's real opposition to her measure and other gun control bills. So uh, the whole thing is is very interesting to me. Of course, Illinois is trying to crack down on them because they, you know, they want to run things. But even in Illinois, there's counties and cities that want to uh, take control of their own uh, future. Genevieve, what do you think of that? Well, I, I, I think it's great. I know um, PA is pretty good on gun laws right now. Uh, it's a, probably a lot harder, Ed, where you are over in California, but it's nice to know that we've got places to go just in case, you know, these sanctuaries for the 2A community. I think that's cool. I do too, Ed. Yeah. Well, Illinois. I'd love it if California had some of those. <laughs> well, they have. <laughs> they have lots of stuff. <laughs> we got the beach. We got the weather. That's about it. Yep. Now, yeah. opponents in uh, New Mexico are saying that Second Amendment sanctuaries are not enforceable. And I think this mm -hmm. is pretty interesting. So in Santa Fe, sheriffs in Second Amendment sanctuary counties said that they won't enforce certain gun control bills being proposed by lawmakers in Santa Fe if those bills become law. I think that's pretty reasonable. But I don't know. This, this is going to turn into something, I think. The, these, the counties and cities are, are saying, nope, we're not going to have it. And especially places like Colorado, where Fort Collins and Boulder and Denver are three blue areas on the map surrounded by seas of red, but they are the ones that kind of direct our, our political stuff uh, just because of gerrymandering and the way that the voting districts are, are, are locked up. But clearly this is cities, counties, whatever that are taking a stand. I think that uh, this is going to be a thing that, that we see a lot more of, and we're going to see a lot of pretty big fights, whether it's in the courtrooms or on the streets from this stuff. Would you agree, Ed? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I know that, most of this would be um, delegated to the county sheriff to enforce. And there's a lot of county sheriffs out there that are pro two way that say, I'm not going to endanger my people to enforce a, a law. That's not right. 
Yeah. The next story that we're going to talk about is eight attorney generals tell the Supreme Court of the United States that the Second Amendment covers suppressors too. I think this is interesting. This comes to us after that case in Kansas, uh, where Kansas has laws that kind of protect people from federal laws as regard as relates to certain uh, areas of that. And this is a guy who went into a Navy or an Army surplus store and bought a suppressor off the shelf with no tax stamp, background check, anything like that, because Kansas law uh, defended that. Now, Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt and seven other AGs representing Arkansas, Idaho, Louisiana, Montana, South Carolina, Texas, and Utah, they've actually asked the Supreme Court to review a court of appeals for the Tenth Circuit decision that held that firearms accessories fall outside the scope of the Second Amendment protections. Genevieve, wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think um, any anything that would make a suppressor easier to obtain would be really, really cool. I mean, it is kind of amazing the amount of background checks and wait time that is involved in getting a suppressor currently as opposed to just purchasing a firearm. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit absurd. <laughs> yeah, I, I 100% agree. Now, Ed, the Tenth Circuit explained that uh, in their in their decision that a silencer is a firearm accessory, it's not a weapon in itself, nor is it armor of defense, in quotes. Accordingly, it can't be a bearable arm protected by the Second Amendment. And the AGs say in holding that firearms accessories are categorically excluded from the Second Amendment's protections, the Tenth Circuit improperly narrowed the scope of that important amendment in conflict with the decisions of this court and other circuits. This court's review is needed to affirm that the arms protected by the Second Amendment include such items as silencers and other firearms accessories. I mean, that would be a utopia, in my opinion. Ed, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, they pretty much set up a, a precedent with a bump stock. If, if they can single out an accessory, then why can't... The, the same uh, application be applied to a suppressor. Yeah, I agree. And uh, here's the thing. If this goes through, if the Supreme Court does take this and does rule that suppressors are basically protected under the Second Amendment, that would be a huge rippling effect. And the bump stock ban would basically be invalidated because it is a firearms accessory, at least the way that I I'm reading this. So uh, here's hoping. And again, mm -hmm. Trump has two appointees, possibly even three if RBG uh, ends up leaving the bench for some reason. So that might be the biggest legacy, in my opinion, that a president has had in my lifetime. I agree. Next, I want one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've got five. I want I want one for every gun. Why not? <laughs> Did you guys hear the story? A Coast Guard lieutenant arrested on gun and drug charges labeled a domestic terrorist. At first, I was like, oh, whatever. I'm not buying it. But then I kind of read through it a little bit he wasn't found with what I would consider a lot of stuff when they, when they raided him, they've recovered 15 firearms and more than a thousand rounds of ammunition from his cramped basement apartment. What they also found was a spreadsheet of so-called traders subdivided into three categories, A, B, and C category. A traders included a bunch of Democrats and senators and, uh, you know, just politicians, things like that. Uh, and B and C continued on and on and on this, this guy apparently, um, pretty extremist and it seems like they stopped something that was going to be pretty bad I, I wasn't able to find in the article where specifically they they had um the the reason to uh go serve their warrants or whatever but it does seem like they stopped something bad jen what do you uh, genevieve what do you think uh, I do agree with you that owning 15 guns and over a thousand rounds of ammunition isn't really that absurd I mean I have way more than that you know um but threatening or even wanting to harm a bunch of people on the left where I, I can agree with being upset with them, but we shouldn't stoop to that level that other people have stooped to, you know, and it, I, I think it's a good thing that he got arrested, honestly, because from reading that article, it seemed like he had malicious intent. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. And here's the thing. I despise a lot of democratic politicians. I, you know what? I despise people that are anti-gun uh, yeah. in general. I am friends with a ton of people that are anti-gun. I don't want, I don't wish them harm. I don't wish people that I disagree with on political issues harm. Um, that's just my thoughts on the matter. Ed, what are your thoughts? Well, I saw the picture of what was seized and in some places, and especially with my friends, that's considered a starter pack. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Those are rookie but, numbers. But I completely agree with you. Um, I don't wish harm against anybody. And I, I think they stopped a tragedy that basically would have colored everybody with, you know, those types of guns as being, you know, nuts like the guy was. So it, it saved everybody. It was a win-win. 
I agree. He had drafted three months uh, prior to his arrest, an email to friends in quotes, in which he said he's dreaming of a way to kill almost every last person on the earth. I think a plague would be most successful, but how do I acquire the needed Spanish flu, botulism and anthrax? Not sure yet. Oh my gosh. So he was clearly uh, an idiot and I'm glad he's off the streets personally. Yeah. I'd have to agree with you there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty nuts. All right. So California, they hate the guns. Uh, as a as a as a state, but there's a lot of gun owners in California. Well, now California, you know, they're taking gun rights away, left and right, left and right. But now they want uh, more hunters. They've actually uh, the California Department of Wildlife has put forth a I don't know what what do you call it a program where they're trying to get more people to hunt, which seems so weird coming from California. <laughs> Uh, hunting actually has dropped quite a bit in the United States through the 70s and 80s. And a uh, 2016 survey by U.S. Fish and Wildlife showed only about 5% of Americans over the age of 16 hunt, which was a 50% decline in five decades. Uh, so California is really working. Uh, the, the Department of Wildlife in California is really working hard to bring more hunters to California, which I don't know. It, it just seems so weird to me. Ed, uh, being in California, what do you think about this? Well, you know, California is very much split by region. Um, Southern California is very urban, so we don't have the same hunting or firearm culture here that exists in Northern California. So in Southern California, I know some people that hunt, but not like Northern California. But I got to admit, California is taking kind of a bipolar approach to this. Because on one hand, they're doing everything they can to create more levels of control. And then on the other hand, they're trying to make more money by selling more hunting licenses. So it's really hard to kind of uh, rationalize their approach. And I read the article and I just scratched my head. <laughs> I know. It was just, I was like, well, I had to go to the top and be like, wait, where is this coming from? Cal California. No, I read it right. <laughs> Genevieve. Uh, what do you make of all this? Um, I mean, you know, they want more hunters. Great. I'm super for that. Uh, it is a little bit weird coming from them. I do think that they are way less afraid of shotguns and bolt action rifles than they are with AR-15s or anything like that. So, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense that they would advocate towards that before they did anything else in the industry. But Ed's point about the hunting licenses and them making money off of that, that's a very interesting thing that I didn't think about. <laughs> Yeah, so much. Uh, money generated from license fees and taxes on guns and ammunition provide approximately 60% of the funding to state wildlife agencies. Uh, that's huge. And yeah. since 1937, uh, hunters have contributed more than $14 billion to the conservation, management, and restoration of wildlife in the United States. So, I mean, hunting isn't just about, you know, uh, food and things like that. It's about conservation. And for people out there, if, you, if you're a gun person and you haven't gone on a hunt, Maybe try it, like figure out a place where you can do something that is, is uh, palatable to you uh, and go out and, and get out in nature and actually try it. Uh, I, I encourage people to hunt. Uh, I've hunted small things. I went on an antelope hunt this year. I didn't get anything, um, but it was really nice just to, to get my gun ready and to get out there and to make sure I had my gear and then get out there and, and just spend time in America. I thought it was pretty great. So if you're a gun person, and you haven't hunted, I highly suggest, you know, get with somebody who has, get out there and do it. Next story, North Dakota lawmakers kill red flag bill and block gun buybacks with public funds. Pretty good news out of North Dakota, but uh, lawmakers in the Republican controlled body sent a strong pro gun message on Tuesday by making it illegal to use public dollars to buy private guns while turning away uh, a so-called red flag bill. This is pretty great news, means they can't do gun buybacks and things like that, which also a pretty good thing, especially in today's climate. And getting rid of that red flag bill was pr pretty great. Uh, Genevieve, what do you think about both of those things in North Dakota? I read that article earlier today and I got so excited. I can't even tell you. I hate red flag laws so much. And I post a lot on my Instagram page about mental health and I'm a huge advocate for that. And in the same vein, an advocate for not having your guns taken away from you because you have some issues. So I think that red flag, frag, ugh, red flag laws are very stupid <laughs> and I'm very proud of them for denying that from passing. Totally agree. What do you, why do you think that red flag laws are stupid? Uh, just because 
going going around the whole due process thing, like the whole idea of having somebody else call you unsafe without you even being able to defend yourself. It just doesn't really sound like freedom to me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I just, I don't really think that it's fair. There's a lot of times when someone can have a stupid feud with someone and they can go after their, their firearms without them even being able to defend themselves. You know, and I don't, I don't think that that's right just because somebody goes to get help for an anxiety issue that everybody in the U S has. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And I think that that, that generally uh, a stigma is almost placed on things like that. And yes. I think red flag laws make that even worse and perpetuate uh, the inability of people to get the help that they need uh, without fear of you know becoming a target of one of these extreme risk protection orders or something like that. Would you agree? Oh, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think that that's going to be the opposite of what's good uh, and the good that they hope to do with these ERPOs and red flag laws. Uh, by mm -hmm. stigmatizing this even worse, I think that's one of the worst things they could possibly do. Yeah, it just perpetuates a problem that can be fixed really easily, but people are too afraid to go and fix it because of things like this. So, yeah, I agree. Ed, what do you think? Well, when I read it, I thought, you know, it's about time to trade in my flip flops for some snowshoes <laughs> and, and yeah. head off to the great tundra. Um, <laughs> It, it, I, I've got a real problem with, you know, skirting the 15th Amendment and not having due process where you're considered guilty um, and have to prove your own innocence. Um, I think that also this is something that you can give California credit for. Um, I want to say it started here and like a cancer is spreading and it's pretty disturbing on a constitutional level. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's, it's yeah. a disaster. Uh, but we'll see. They're passing more and more all the time. I think, uh, let's see, I just read over in the chat, New York just passed a ridiculous red flag bill. Uh, that was our producer, Kenny Ortega, said that. And they're they're going in all over the place. I think we're going to see one very soon here in Colorado, which is ridiculous. Uh, we've got uh, Leslie Hollywood, who is a uh, gun rights advocate, and she's on the We Like Shooting Show on the Firearms Radio Network next week to talk about her work against red flag laws in Colorado. So, uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, listen to We Like Shooting next week and uh, hear a lot more about red flag laws and all that good stuff. Will do. Awesome. Yes, definitely. Washington man arrested for threatening pro-gun sheriff. So uh, 1639 passed in Washington. A bunch of sheriffs came out and said, you know what? These laws are almost impossible to enforce. What do you expect us to do? We are not going to enforce these. And a little so a snowflake. Uh, basically said sheriffs that are non-compliant will be shot by me. Another post on Facebook <laughs> said, I really want to kill a police officer. Uh, another post on Facebook said, I love how all my nightmares come true. Um, this, this guy just kind of, kind of ridiculous. And it just goes back to it. Like generally second amendment adv advocates, gun people, you don't hear them saying things like this. And the people who I think are very anti-gun Sometimes I think they fear themselves and what they might do if they had uh, an item that could kill people. And this guy is just clearly exactly that. Now he's in custody. Uh, he's going to be charged with uh, threats and I don't see exactly what he's going to be charged with, but he is definitely in custody and booked into Spokane County jail. Ed, what are your thoughts on that? That kind of violence uh, when it comes to laws? Yeah, I I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, I see this guy is basically, you know, cleaning up the gene pool. Um, if if you're going to be that stupid, then, well, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Um, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You know, it's just, that's it, all I got. Yeah, it's so crazy. Uh, Genevieve, what do you think? Uh, I actually, I read in that article uh, that he also claims to speak for the trees. So, I mean, that's really all that I needed to know about that guy. But honestly, I think that it just, it gives everybody kind of a bad name, which is really unfortunate. I, I knew a guy once who said, I don't care about your political beliefs. Just let me know when I can go in the street and start shooting people. And it's like, this is why, this is why we're not liked <laughs> because you people speak the loudest and it sucks. <laughs> yep. That is and, and honestly, even on this show, we've had people talk about things like that. And, you know, everyone's, everyone's entitled to their opinion, whether right. I agree with it or not is a, a completely different thing. But I don't think that does us any good when we talk about it's time to start, you know, stacking bodies and things like that. I don't think that does us a lot of good. And I don't know. It's a, it, it, it is definitely a tough time. Yeah. 
New York pistol permit law is headed to the appeals court. Uh, this is a pretty interesting one. Uh, U.S. Court of Appeals case could overturn state pistol permit laws. This comes to us again from New York City, and the U.S. Court of Appeals is hearing oral arguments from attorney James Ostrowski challenging the state's pistol permit requirements. Um, the reason this is interesting is if it did pass, it, it would kind of ripple throughout the entire United States and change places that are May issue to pretty much everywhere being shall issue and probably challenged in the Supreme Court at some point. I think that uh, may issue is it's absolutely a gun ban because they may issue based on whatever crazy arbitrary regime they put into place. Genevieve, how do you feel about uh, kind of just that thing, that case and uh, pistol permit laws across the United States as a whole? So I, I was um, skimming through that article and I don't think I got to read the whole thing. So is New York going towards more of a, a relaxed state as far as pistol permit laws or are they doing the opposite? They're doing the opposite right now. Oh, okay. I believe New York is a May issue, but I, I do know that it's pretty difficult, if not damn near impossible right. to get a, a concealed carry permit in New York. Okay. Yeah. I have, I've never actually been there personally, but I, I have heard stories from, uh, people who are up there and it's just, it's really hard for them to be able to do what they want. And I think it's a, it's a little bit ridiculous, but I, there's always going to be some States that are on a totally different wavelength than everybody else. I guess um, I would really hope that in the future, they, they relax on that a little bit. Yeah. And as I understand it in New York, uh, it's so difficult to get a permit that you basically have to know the right people and if you don't, right. it, it doesn't get approved unless you can actually prove, you know, whatever requirements they have. Uh, right. Living in, in California, where it's also a, um, a May issue place, uh, you know a little bit how, how difficult that is based on where you live. But what do you think about New York, California and just pistol permits? Well, I, I think there's some, you know, strong, uh, some strong crossovers uh, in, in Riverside County, where I'm at, we've got a pro gun sheriff. And we've got about 99% of the people that apply get it. But then you look at L.A. and it's almost exactly the opposite, where you only get about 2%. So L.A. is pretty much in lockstep with, uh, um, you know, New York City. Uh, a lot of it's also based on the fact that they're both, uh, you know, ruled by liberal, um, liberal politicians. So it, it goes right along with, you know, um, the, the entire belief system and i think it eventually it's going to get to the supreme court i wouldn't be surprised i think it would be a good thing especially with the supreme court we have right now mm -hmm. yeah this one's not uh, not necessarily here at home but there was a hijacking foiled on a bangladesh dubai flight suspect was killed um passenger flight made an emergency landing because they had someone who was acting kind of crazy uh had a weapon on the plane and ended up dying in a shootout but we don't really hear about this much in the United States. And I just kind of wanted to talk about that. We've put things in place. And though we know that TSA uh, through news reports and, and other, you know, uh, government reports and things like that, TSA is reasonably ineffective at preventing things from going on, but we haven't heard about anything necessarily bad like this in the United States in quite a while. The worst thing we had was the doctor that United, uh, you know, beat down in the aisle and dragged off the plane. Uh, do you think that that's because of TSA or other or other requirements or are we just lucky, Genevieve? I, I think it might be a little bit of a combination of both. I personally am terrified of flying, so I don't ever want to admit that TSA doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, so, did something. they took my, my $400 pocket knife once. Oh, hey, well, there you go. Look, they work like yeah. one tenth of the time. Um, <laughs> you know, I hearing about this kind of stuff and reading that article, it just it, it's a really scary read. Um, I believe that the plane was headed towards Dubai and it sort of just reinforced my desire to never go over to that area. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. Yeah. Ed, what do you think? Well, you know, even though TSA probably has a lot to be desired, especially when you consider you know, the security that company our countries like is Israel puts up. And like Genevieve, I'm scared to death of flying commercial. <laughs> I do it because I have to, not because I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. But you just got to ask yourself, what kind of security did they have in place that allowed, you know, guns to get on board? Um, otherwise, you know, this guy made a 
huge error thinking that he was going to get away with it and uh, didn't work out so well for him. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, stuff like that, I think, uh, I mean, the fact that we don't hear about stuff like this in the U.S. Um, at all anymore, I think does speak to how effective, you know, our policies and procedures have been. Definitely, there's a lot that are overreaching. Uh, and a lot of airlines do ridiculous things like Delta, I believe, zip tying your bags, which you can just easily twist off with a pen. Um, they're not doing anything, but there are some uh, procedures that they're doing that seem to be working. I'm just worried that it's not, I don't know, is it working or are, have we just been lucky, I guess, is my final thought on that. Well, I think that being observant is probably the most effective tool against this stuff. Like what happened in the article, everyone noticed it going on. So as long as we can just be aware of our surroundings when we're flying or doing anything else that makes us a little bit nervous, I think that's the best tool that we could possibly have. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Tony Simon um, said that since 9-11, we are known to beat down crazy people on planes. And that might be, <laughs> I mean, we talked about... <laughs> An armed society being a polite society. We also talk about a society mm -hmm. where if someone starts acting crazy on the plane, they're going to take a hit. Uh, so that, that <laughs> might also dissuade people from doing, doing nonsense. Anyway, enough about that. I want to talk about a sovereign citizen. He was arrested in Minnesota with a possible explosive device. Uh, he got pulled over <laughs> by police for a revoked license. He told officers he didn't need a license. He tried the Obi-Wan Kenobi on him. <laughs> Uh, because he's a free citizen, a tense standoff ensued and lasted uh, about four hours and 20 minutes. And eventually they got him out. They, they put chemicals into the car. He came out. They found a pig shaped device with, uh, with written on it, expletive, the police. And they're looking that it's a possible explosive. So just uh, kind of interesting. And that whole sovereign citizen ideology is one that I am fascinated by. Uh, <laughs> think, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's one, it's a little bit ridiculous of this guy to claim that he doesn't need a driver's license because he's a sovereign citizen. I mean, come on. And two, I just I think it's really incredible how the police officers handled this entire situation. I just I have the utmost respect for them because being in a situation like that for four hours or more, I mean, I can't even imagine doing that. And I, I think it's good that they caught this guy because he, he's got some screws loose, I think. <laughs> I can just picture this dude in the car with the window <laughs> cracked, screaming, am I being detained? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't mean to make fun. Like I, I, I like to try to accept people for whatever beliefs they have, but this is one that is, is difficult for me to get behind. I yeah. like, I understand the concept behind it, but uh, Ed, what are your, what are your thoughts here? Well, my first thought was, you know, the, the guy probably had more to worry about from the hundreds of people backed up in traffic behind him <laughs> than he did from the cop. <laughs> and I'm sure that all the cop had to say is, I'm going to walk away, but I'm going to let the hundred people behind you deal with you. Um, <laughs> good luck with that. I, I do agree <laughs> with that. <laughs> a lot of road rage there is my guess. And oh, I'm yeah. sure that he, uh, he interrupted a lot of uh, commutes. <laughs> Speaking about the guy in Washington that threatened to shoot the sheriffs that didn't um, didn't go through with I-1639. We have conservative, conservative activists assaulted at the Berkeley campus. He's now spoken out a bit. And Hayden Williams, 26, was assaulted while helping recruit conservatives at a, uni, at a UC Berkeley uh, event and was just kind of there. Uh, people started yelling at him and then started throwing punches. Uh, the pictures are... He, he definitely took a beating. And it just comes back to, I saw over, I think it was Alex over in the, the YouTube chat said that uh, violence is being normalized on the left. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, Genevieve, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that violence is being normalized on the left side of the aisle uh, politically? Uh, or are we just kind of seeing some of the, the most unreasonable stuff? To be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure either way. I do believe a little bit that violence is being normalized, but at the same time, I don't know. I don't know exactly if what we're seeing is all the way truthful. You know how how news stations are with that kind of stuff. But just from hearing friends of mine who have Instagram accounts, and actually my own Instagram account, I posted a picture of a gun, just a gun, and I was like, "Oh, this is my EDC. What's yours?" Someone commented on it and said, "So you admit to killing children?" And I was like, what? <laughs> like, uh, that's a leap, buddy. That's a big leap. <laughs> I'm like, EDC, what does ED stand for? Maybe I don't, maybe it doesn't mean what I think it means. 
Right, exactly. So I I do think that a lot of times being pro 2A to some of the extreme leftists is like a personal insult to them. So it, it just it kind of sucks that we're not able to have our own opinion without them reacting in very extreme ways. And I do see that happening more often than I did in the past. So I suppose, yes, I, I do actually think that violence is being normalized a little bit. Ed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I see it too. I was a former history professor at a community college, and I haven't done that since 2002. But you could see you could see the intolerance creeping up even 20 years ago. And um, frankly, I'm glad I'm not in that industry anymore. Um, I have read a little bit. There was some more stuff that came out about the Berkeley assault today. And apparently they've been able to put a name to the guy. Um, I'm not going to mention it just because, you know, um, if, if it's out there, I'm not going to increase uh, this guy's uh, notoriety and bring any harm to him if it's wrong. Um, but despite the name, supposedly this guy is from Riverside, California, um, and is also a known Antifa member. They were able to compare photographs from a previous arrest. So the guy wasn't even a Berkeley student. So, you know, word on the street is he was flown in for this. Wow. But, you know, if it's on the Internet, it must be true, right? <laughs> uh, of all the things to do, being a conservative activist at Berkeley must be one of the hardest. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and to be clear, this guy is not a student at Berkeley. He was just there uh, doing some recruiting for conservative causes and things like that. Look, I... I don't know if you guys watch Steven Crowder. Um, yeah. one, I actually, I really enjoy the guy and I think his videos are reasonably interesting, but his change my mind series where he goes on college campuses and things like that to see the, the, the vile and vitriol that is hurled at him. It's pretty interesting. And I, I mean, at least in the edited videos that he shows, he's uh, reasonable and backs things up with facts. And I realize that it is definitely a uh, confirmation bias on my part that I agree with him. But just seeing the way some people act is really uh, an interesting study in just uh, the sociological pathologies of politics and things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to mention that since all of us are involved in EDC, we, we also know better that we're not supposed to go into situations to provoke. So for us, it's more important to be invisible than to try to go out and try to gain attention and you know, either uh, try to provoke or inadvertently provoke, just avoid dangerous situations and not go looking for them. Yeah. And this is, that's a, that's a really interesting point that you bring up because on the one hand uh, I do carry daily uh, because I've decided that my life is more important than someone who would choose to steal mine. Um, but I also, I think being an activist is very important for us as second amendment uh, advocates and just people that that enjoy guns and the freedoms that we enjoy as americans and i feel like that i almost feel like if i if i try to be political that i can't carry my firearm but being political these days uh based on what we see and read and hear uh it seems like it might be a little bit dangerous especially if violence is being normalized on the left side of that political aisle so it's like do i have to choose to be unarmed and possibly lose my life in order to act politically uh it's kind of a, it is a catch 22 and it's something that I think about quite often. Well, you know, the, our forefathers, you know, there's a whole reason behind having a second amendment so that you could go where you wanted and say where you wanted, say what you wanted without fear of, of, uh, you know, being accosted or assaulted, but mm -hmm. people treat the, the, the constitution as a flexible document. And because of that, they don't see the, uh, the context of the original writing. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with everything that you guys are saying. It is dangerous to have an opinion without a way to protect yourself anymore. When, when Trump got elected, I was 21. So I had just gotten my carry permit and I was living in downtown Philadelphia at the time. And I saw a couple of people surrounding this ancient looking veteran who was obviously pro gun, had the hats on and everything. And they were just harassing him. And I, I made the decision that day to never leave my house without my gun. I totally 100% agree. Yeah. Interesting times. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, here we go. Federal judge upholds bump stock ban. I'm going to go uh, away from the, the 
story that's in the news and go to Firearms Policy Coalition. Now, Firearms Policy Coalition, through their um, legislative action branch or whatever it happens to be, I don't remember, it's uh, Firearms Policy Foundation, actually. They hired uh, Prince Law to file an injunction against the bump stock ban uh, just until they could get a final ruling on whether A, the attorney general actually had the authority to sign that, B, whether it was constitutional. There's going to be a, a big, long, out, long drawn out fight. Well, that injunction uh, on Monday, February 25th, was actually rejected by the judge in a 64-page ruling, uh, meaning that it's going to have to go forward in the court system and that when that deadline from the ATF and Justice Department comes, uh, people will either have to turn in or destroy their bump stock, uh, bump stocks. I guess it's interesting. I had talked to Adam Kraut earlier in the week, and he said they expected any day, and this actually came out the evening after, but he was actually very uh, positive about their chances of getting this, this injunction on that rule. Uh, it turns out the judge didn't see it that way. And this is a, this is a tough time because this, is going, this court case is going to be out there for a very long time. And even if it ends up being ruled in our favor and bump stocks are not banned, anyone who still has one will have been breaking the law for a couple of years. And I don't, I, I don't know where this is going to go. I'm really, really disappointed. Uh, Genevieve, what are your thoughts? I, I agree with you on being disappointed about this one. I, I do legitimately can have an understanding on why uneducate, uneducated people would be nervous about bump stocks. I do get it. Uh, but I, I also think that if you don't know anything, then educate yourself. Like banning, banning bump stocks is not going to prevent mass shootings from happening. It's not going to, it's not going to prevent killings from happening in general. I mean, you could take a car and, and murder a bunch of people if you really wanted to. Guns are not the problem. Bump stocks are not the problem. It's people. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I think it's ridiculous and it sucks that all of these people will have been, officially breaking the law if this doesn't go through you know that's that's unfortunate and ridiculous and I, i'm just shocked the the original news story that's actually in the show notes is from msn uh nbc news i'm sorry and it, the headline is federal judge upholds trump administration's ban on rapid fire bump stocks none of that is true all they did is declined a temporary injunction against um this unconstitutional regulation ed what are your thoughts on the whole thing well I think the judge made an unreasonable decision, knowing that this was going to go on. The you know the injunction to prevent people from you know being charged makes perfect sense. It's like let's wait and see how these things work out in court. You know, instead, this judge is basically making policy before a judgment has been actually cast. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't seem to really make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, it really doesn't. So uh, the deadline is excuse me, is still active. And I think it's sometime in March, if I recall correctly, but yeah, this, this case is not going to be done by then. So this was a, this is a pretty big black eye for uh, the side of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indiana man shoots himself at the range while reholstering. I uh, <laughs> saw this uh, comes to us from personal defense world and man, I don't want to laugh. Like it's, Oh, it's bad. This, the whole situation is bad. So it's this guy, he's like shooting, he's drawn from his holster. He tries to put, it's a soft, it looks like a pan, it is a pancake holster, like a soft uh, remora, I believe, holster that he's trying to put his gun back in while in the waistband, which is the exact opposite of what I teach people if they choose to use like a sticky holster or a remora holster and trying to put it in his waistband, trying to put it in his waistband, finally lets go of the gun and the gun like flops out of the pancake holster because it wasn't fully in his waistband. And then he's grabbing for it, grabbing for it, and eventually has a negligent discharge, shooting himself in the leg. And wow, there's so much to unpack here. Ed, let's start with you. <laughs> uh, lay it on us. Well, I, I saw this is a great video for what not to do. And, you know, the guy made mistakes from day one. Uh, you know, the burst that comes with a decocker, he could have made the gun safe before he did any of that, and he would have been okay. But he was doing a draw from an enclosed booth, which is just a bad practice. He wasn't looking what he was doing when he was reholstering, which is a bad practice. Uh, he had the wrong holster for the job. Um, I see this all the time on the range where I'll stop people 
and tell them, you know, what TV show did you get that from? Um, because there's a right way of doing it and a wrong way of doing it. And I tell everybody the most dangerous part is the holster work. That's where most accidents happen. But you get a lot of people that are self-taught or don't care or don't want to, you know, seek a professional. And this is what you end up with. Yeah. And he's just so cavalier about it. Genevieve thoughts. So I think that even if he went through doing all of these things wrong, if he had just done the one thing that I'll teach my students is that if you drop the gun, don't try to catch it. <laughs> like if he just didn't catch it, none of this would have happened. Like it's going to fall on the floor and it's not going to go off. Don't try to catch it. And I was reading the article and it says that this guy is, is, pretty involved in the shooting sports. I think it, it mentions that he might even be an instructor. I could be wrong on that, but I know that he has had experience shooting. So we all get complacent sometimes, especially when we're around it every day, but we can't forget the basic rules of safe shooting. <laughs> I could not agree more. And if you have a sticky holster, remora or some kind of soft holster that collapses on itself, when you reholster, take it out of your waistband, put the gun in it safely mm -hmm. and put the entire apparatus back in your waistband. Yeah. And, uh, just don't try to put a gun. <laughs> in that holster. There, the good news is, is he wasn't uh, practicing doing it. Uh, appendix carry. <laughs> that that hey. is true actually. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> there is that. Didn't know the guy was a sharpshooter. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to move up to Florida man kills a neighbor that threatened him in potential stand your ground case. Uh, this comes to us from the Orlando Sentinel. Apparently this guy sees a couple of his neighbors arguing. He goes out, tries to get involved and, and to stop it goes back in to call 911. One of the neighbors comes onto his property. He puts several bullets in him and it looks like it's going to be a test of the, of the stand your ground uh, law in Florida. And I don't know. There's a lot, there's a lot here. I'll save, I'll save my commentary and Genevieve, I'm going to start with you. Uh, okay. Clearly a lot of things done wrong here uh, that led to this, but what do you think? Well, from from reading the article, it seems like this man and his neighbor neighbor were having a a loud argument, loud enough for other neighbors to come out and try to break up the argument. I think that before it escalated to the point that it did, the man could have done something like go into his house and lock the door and call the police or do something to mitigate the situation before it turned out to be what it is. And, you know, I, I like the stand your ground laws, but it just seems like something was done incorrectly here to me. It, it, it just seems it seems like a, a loud argument turned into something that it really didn't need to turn into. Yeah, uh, that's a tough one for me. Ed, what do you think? I, I'd have to mirror everything that Genevieve just said. Um, th this was completely preventable. Yeah, and this is the tough one. This is uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, George Zimmerman. You know, he inserted himself into a situation like he may have been justified in using lethal force against someone who was over him laying on the ground and pounding his head into the sidewalk. The problem is, is that he put himself into that situation. It wasn't random chance. It wasn't anything else. He put himself into a situation that he had to use lethal force to get out of. And that's the part that mm -hmm. really uh, turns, turns my stomach. Like, and Ed, you, you even mentioned it already. Like we have to be polite and, and conflict avoidant and, and all those other things. I mean, sometimes being a good witness is, is the most that we can do without putting ourselves in harm of either, you know, taking, taking injuries or death ourselves or having to employ that against someone else. Right. No, absolutely. So yeah, this one, uh, you know, I'm glad Florida has this law because if he felt his life was in danger, I'm glad he defended it. But mm -hmm. again, it's it, it all comes back to don't put yourself in situations like this. It, it seemed completely avoidable, at least from this person who had to end another person's life. Yeah. The best way to win a gunfight is to not get in a gunfight. <laughs> Amen. 100% agree. All right. Let's move into the I'm offended segment. Another city is letting children drive policy on this show. Uh, we've seen uh, something kind of sweeping the nation after Parkland in Florida, where we're letting kids uh, really tell policymakers and politicians how to legislate and what's important to legislate. I think that kids being involved in government is extremely important. In Helena, Montana, uh, there's a group of students that are basically helping to put together a bill, this legislative session that they hope will help address gun safety in Montana. Um, 
yeah, I don't even know what to say about that. I didn't realize there was a big problem with gun violence in Montana. I didn't realize that there was enough people to fill a high school in Montana, actually. But what do you think, uh, Genevieve? Do you think kids should be guiding public policy? I agree with you that children getting involved in government is very important because they need to be educated. The problem with educating these kids nowadays is that in public school, it's all to the left. I mean, I've heard crazy stories from you know, children getting bad grades on tests because they didn't want to dislike the president that we have right now. I mean, it's just everybody who's in a public school right now has leftist views because that's what they're taught. So it's a little bit ridiculous to have them organizing all of these organizations to, you know, mitigate gun violence when they don't know really anything other than what they're taught in the school. It's a it's an unfair opinion. It's biased. A lot of it's very driven by emotion instead of facts. And that that's the kind of thing that, that I find concerning. And mm -hmm. I agree, include the kids in legislative process and political things. But when we start letting them guide policy based on their emotions and what they need, um, I just think that's bad policy. Ed, what are your thoughts? Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's the sort of thing, depending on where you are, this sort of legislation could go either way. Um, what I saw that was encouraging about this article is there's actually a move so that firearm safety will be taught in the schools. Oh. That's what the kids wanted. So, you know, I could see where this story would go completely the other way, you know, like what happened after Parkland and what all the non-experts were saying. But what the kids uh, in Montana were saying is, no, let's give it, get some firearms education courses in the school which is much more proactive and, and a lot wiser. I was actually surprised by the outcome of the story. Yeah, I think that one's good. The stuff that has me a little bit more concerned is fines for people to leave guns unsecured, what those mean, mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So, I mean, again, like kids can have opinions. Kids deserve to be able to voice those opinions. It's up to politicians, legislators, and other adults to actually guide um, things that should be in law. But yeah, I, I, that's definitely a good part of it. This one's uh, interesting. Ohio school cancels shoot the president game amid <laughs> severe backlash. Now, me personally, when Barack Obama was our president, I referred to him as President Obama. I respect the office of the president more than I respect the individual in it, which I clearly, uh, I respect the individual in it as well. But the office is, is much more important to me. Uh, than who fills it at a time. So when we talk about things like this, it's just ridiculous. Uh, let me read a little bit about what it was. Brief description didn't in include any specific reference to President Trump, but basically, uh, where'd it go? There's a there is one president with bodyguards. Everyone else basically gets Nerf guns and tries to eliminate or shoot the president. They called that something different than I was in school, which was also apparently inappropriate and we're not allowed to do anymore. But this just. <laughs> <laughs> a bad idea all around. Genevieve? Uh, I read I, <laughs> I read this article and I had to read it actually like two or three times because I couldn't believe that this was an actual thing that was occurring. I mean, I, I, I'm very conservative of a person, but even if it was when Barack Obama was in office, I would have never been okay with people Great. playing a game like this. I mean... It just, it goes against common human decency. And exactly like you said, Sean, respect the office, respect the president, no matter what their views are. You can't just, you can't just go around shooting people you don't like. Oh, so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's pretty obvious. You know, I was a teacher. I, I, I can't imagine. And I think this was actually done at a community center rather than um, uh, school, but I, I think we're splitting hairs there. It, it, it's a bad idea, regardless of the venue. Mm -hmm. It's it's completely disrespectful. Um, I'm really surprised the Secret Service didn't show up. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it's a good point. <laughs> they yeah. still might. Uh, I don't even know. Well, I guess we'll consent. We'll continue in California just because we already talked about the conservative <laughs> activists being beat up at UC Berkeley, but now UC Davis professors reprimanded for saying police need to be killed. And just to be clear, what he actually said on Twitter was, I mean, it's easier to shoot cops when their backs are turned. No, uh, people think that cops need to be reformed. They need to be killed. I am thankful that every living cop will be, 
one day be dead, some by their own hands, some by others, too many of old age. Hashtag let's not make more. These are all tweets uh, tweeted by this UC Davis professor who has now been reprimanded. This is ridiculous. Ed? Well, UC Davis is known for being way out on the fringe to begin with. Um, It all goes back to the educational system and uh, where their loyalties and agenda lies. I mean, that, that speaks for itself. Um, you're, you're, you you got to consider the source. You got to consider the environment. Am I surprised? No, not really. Guy will probably get promoted next year. Yeah, probably He'll get tenure. Genevieve. Well, I, I truly hope that this guy does not get tenure. Honestly, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. You know, I, I do agree on one hand that the reason that I carry a gun is because a lot of times the police won't be able to respond fast enough, but I also have a very high respect for them. And I'm going to quote myself here from five minutes ago. You cannot go around killing people that you don't like. (laughs) I agree. It's frowned upon. Yes, Yes, it is. Uh, so, so silly. So anyway, he's been reprimanded guys. Everything's going to be okay. He's been, he's had a stern talking to. And, uh, you know, that, that's the, and he'll go back to work on Monday. It's fine. <laughs> uh, thanks for this headline there. Kenny, uh, Dick's dysfunction now has a support. <laughs> <laughs> so the CEOs of Dick Tom's Levi's and RXR realty push gun control in an open letter. Uh, they sent an open letter to Congress saying gun violence in America is not inevitable. It's preventable. There are steps Congress can and must take to prevent and reduce gun violence. And all I see here is that apparently Dick's decline in business that uh, they have even said comes to their stance on gun control wasn't enough for them. And they just want to, uh, to get even less money. Uh, <laughs> Genevieve, what do you think about this uh, political activism on the part of corporations? I think it's a little bit silly. Um, I, I understand to a point wanting to advocate for something that you believe in like i get it but dick sporting goods had a huge they were making a huge amount of money off the hunter's market for a long time and i haven't shopped there for a while since all of that stuff first surfaced but you know you have to you have to imagine that they're losing a lot of money over stuff like this so i just i think it's silly for those corporations that are big enough like that to get involved in politics. Like if you want to make your voice heard, then go do it somewhere else outside of your company. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I hope that they suffer even more for this. I'm sorry to their employees, but uh, this company is just making misstep after misstep and Mm -hmm. they're they're paying the price. Like we've had stories on this show about how much they're, they're in the negative uh, there or how much their business has been affected negatively because of their stance on gun control. And the CEO even said that he doesn't care. And uh, I think that uh, ridiculous. Ed, what do you think? Well, I think the stockholders are only going to have so many limits before they get rid of this guy because the CEO is, you know, has to report to the stockholders. And if their profits are down 75%, they're not going to keep them around. Um, I'm a little tired of the corporate virtue signaling that we're better than everybody else, that they're going to tell us how we should live. Same with Levi's, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. guess what? I buy 5.11s now. Um, You know, I, people shop with their feet, you know, you, same thing with Hollywood. Hollywood's down 23% because of the same thing. Americans are tired of the, the political agenda being pushed by an industry. I think they are. I'm not a boycott kind of guy. Like I had Starbucks this morning, but I'll tell you what, I haven't stepped foot in a Dick's sporting goods in quite a while. They've, they've gone too far in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you. That's uh, a good point too, that you made it. You know, we don't want to be told what to believe in by a corporation. That's a little ridiculous. Completely. <laughs> completely. All right, guys, let's move into our full auto news segment. You know, this is just crazy stuff. Interesting stuff, whatever it happens to be. Genevieve, I'll start with you. What story did you choose? So I'm very excited about this one because I think it is ridiculous and infuriating at the same time. A woman was banned from using Tinder because she posted her profile picture uh, with a deer that she had hunted. So now I I don't know all that much about Tinder, fortunately, from what I've heard. <laughs> but to be banned from anything because of your personal preference of 
whatever you like to spend your time doing is is ridiculous and she didn't she didn't break any of the community guidelines she made sure that there were no firearms or weapons whatsoever in any of the pictures it was it was simply just because she posted a picture hunting and they got angry about it and what what really amazed me is that some people who had been talking to her screenshotted the photos and apparently sent them to the company she works at to try to get her fired just because they uh. were they were upset personally about her choice of how she was trying to spend her time and it's just another example of those extremists who are just doing anything to give us a bad name you know yeah it's so crazy cuz uh apparently hunting uh she's from new england Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, that Vermont. was what it said on there. Yeah, she's from Vermont. She was vacationing in San Francisco, or saying, uh, yeah, San Francisco, <laughs> open tender, posted the pictures, and apparently them San Francisco boys weren't into it. Ed, what do you think? <laughs> well, I think there's a great hunting culture in New England, and, and all I can say is there's, there's a lot of two-way guys that are bummed out now because they'll never be able to hook up with her. Um, <laughs> it... Having never been on Tinder, I, I can only tell you what I've heard, um, but it, it's it's the whole virtue signaling thing over and over and over again, um, and it, it, it's weird because I was talking to a buddy of mine last week who who came up with a great phrase, it's, it's a, a victim fetishization where people now get off on being victims. Hmm. literally so it's almost sexual to where you know i'm more offended than you are and somehow that's hot um and and i can't get my head around that why people would get off on being victims <laughs> swipe left man I'm not <laughs> yeah that's all i'm saying you know oh uh, so silly but yeah i don't i don't get it, it was a uh, bumble was the other um dating app uh, jackie billings actually talked about this uh she wrote a story about it for guns.com uh, where people are not even allowed to show firearms in their bumble profiles no matter no wow. matter what yeah uh ed what was the story you chose um mine was about charlie daniels because you know you gotta like the guy you know he doesn't pull any punches his filter fell out a long time ago and he was basically calling all the uh calling out all the actors at the Oscars um, regarding the fact that so many are out anti-guns, but there was a huge security presence at the Oscar. And, you know, all these folks are, you know, have got armed security while at the same time, you know, are preaching that none of us should have the same. And, and I just found it ironic and just on point. Yeah, I agree. Genevieve. It's just the, the hypocrisy of all of it that is irritating me a lot. And I, I don't have to tell anybody listening to that, to this podcast that, you know, all of these people are advocating for no guns when they have 25 armed security guards around them. And it just drives me up a wall. <laughs> Disgusting hypocrites. I swear. Uh, Hollywood, give me a break. Yeah. I, I really think it would actually be if they would actually lead by example, you know, so many of them make millions on movies that glorify violence why don't they get together and sign a pledge that they will no longer do movies that involve guns because they if wouldn't they make any be, money yeah exactly <laughs> well i mean put your money where your mouth is yeah um, you, you look at some of the the industry leaders that are against this like you know charlie's theron and and she came out with the movie last year um atomic blonde that had a huge body count um and it's like, wait a minute, you know, if you guys are really this serious about it, why don't you guys stop um, making money off of the issue and, and, and just sign a pledge that you're never going to do another movie with a gun and put your money where your mouth is? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could not agree more. Yep. Uh, yeah. Hollywood drives me insane. We should never idolize the thought or, or uh, the concept of celebrity. It, it, I find it vile and I find Hollywood just a disgusting cesspool. Well, they're, they're down 23% <laughs> from last year. They took a bigger hit this year than they did last. Good. And, you know, Keep it people going. Are, people are just turned off. Yeah. Like I, I do not care what a celebrity says. I'm like, we don't live in the same world there, fella. Uh, it's just, uh, you worry about, you know, you worry about different things than the rest of us worry about. Yep. yep. I like characters. I don't care about actors. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I like stories and and tales. That that's about it. I can <laughs> the people who play them. And please, no more remakes. <laughs> <laughs> Except Bill and Ted Three, I want to see that. We, yeah, we don't need another <laughs> Ghostbusters, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, good stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um. All right, that'll do for our stories tonight. But before we go, I want to hear kind of what you guys have been up to and where people can find you. Ed, I'll start with you. Well, you can find us on uh, uh, on YouTube at Shooter the Series. Um, Shooter is spelled S H O Seven E R. We're really stoked because we just passed our 1,000th subscriber. So Woo. we're getting ready to monetize if YouTube likes what we're doing and we meet community standards. Um, we've got some big interviews. We've got a lot of things planned in the future. So we're pretty, pretty psyched about um, the stuff we've been doing on YouTube. Um, I'm also staying pretty busy uh, training individuals, helping people get ready for CCW. Um, you can find me on Thorell Firearms Education and Training on Facebook. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. So just staying busy, hustling every day. Uh, from the sound of the same thing that Genevieve does. I love it. <laughs> Very cool, man. Thank you again, Ed, for being here. We appreciate it. I love it. Happy to come back anytime. Genevieve, how about you? What you been up to? Where can people find everything that you're up to? Well, right now, I only have an Instagram account, Beyond the Unknown. It, uh... Doesn't have all that many subscribers, but I'm very excited about it. I recently got over 5,500, so that's I'm just so stoked. Everybody has been so incredible. <laughs> Seriously, cool. the amount of support has been outstand outstanding. Uh, I at Shot Show, I did a it's sort of like a a mini show, uh, only a couple of minutes long with Guns.com actually, and I I had heard from the guy who did the interview with me that it should be published by the end of this week, so. At SHOT Show, it was with a mental health awareness group called Walk the Talk America. I don't know if anybody here has heard of them before, but they're doing really great stuff. So if anybody's interested in hearing that, it should be out by the end of this week, early next week. Not to, you know, throw guns.com under the bus and push them forward to get it out or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about it. And if anybody wants to check that out, go over to their website or hit up my Instagram, Beyond the Unknown. Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Appreciate it. You did a great job. Thanks for being with us again. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. I don't know what I was nervous about. You host a great show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, you guys did it all. I, I just stood here and read, read headlines. <laughs> uh, but I truly really appreciate not not just you guys for being here, uh, but for everyone who listens, we, we really do appreciate it. Leave us a, a, a review in iTunes. Or if you, know, you have problems, uh, concerns about the show, definitely email me. I've been getting a lot of emails lately. I love it. Um, <laughs> People were upset about what Maj Ture said. And all I got to say to that is uh, people are allowed to have their own opinions, whether you agree with them or not. If you don't like his opinion, I suggest you form your own and share that with people. Uh, I think that's great. I'm not going to tell him he's wrong because I don't, uh, whether I agree with it or not, because he has the right to have it. He has the right to talk about it. And that's just the way it is. Sorry if you don't like it. Um, but really do appreciate the listeners. Really appreciate all the people out there. The, the stats on the show continue to go up and up. So I hope that we're doing something you guys like. Uh, don't forget to check out the second call defense firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. That's where you can find it. It's self-defense insurance insurance. It's incredibly inexpensive, uh, every single month, uh, I believe 10, 12 bucks, something like that is their, their, uh, basic protection package. And if you have a gun in your house, if you carry a gun every day, uh, definitely look into that. They pay everything day one dollar one. So you're never out of pocket. And I think that's pretty important because who has 50 grand sitting around to fight a, a, a prolonged legal battle in either criminal or civil court, right? Not me. <laughs> Not me either. Uh, check out the Patriot Patch Company, patriotpatch.co. Join their Patch of the Month Club. And I just got to say, thanks as always to our super producer, Kenny Ortega. This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. I uh, can't wait to talk to you all next week.